Welcome to Let's Play Rule the Waves 2 as France, starting in 1920. This is episode 99, and apologies for the gap in production. I've been going through major surgery 20 days ago, and it's surprising how much it uh, knocks you off your feet. But I'm keen to get back onto the bicycle of making these videos and talking to you and enjoying myself, and hopefully you enjoying that too. So if I'm not my very best jazz hands today, I hope you forgive me. We're going to talk about two things today. Some ideas around battle tactics, first of all, and then some of your own observations, which have proved really interesting to me. So let's get into it. First of all, I've already kind of discussed, particularly done strike force tactics quite a lot in a series of earlier videos. There is some stuff about carriers, but I produced these four tactical studies on how to be a bit cunning and how to particularly manipulate the situation to the best advantage of guns and torpedoes and how to think of the totality of the battle in order to win the battle and then some random advanced topics. So I know there are nearly two years old now, I mean, two years. Um, but they're still pretty good when I looked over them. I'm still quite pleased with them. So these thoughts are, if you like, an extension of those thoughts after playing uh, this great 1920s to 1955 game. So in terms of fleet actions, what I noticed was myself going through this kind of process as I do it. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's battleships or carriers, the, it's pretty much the same. So first of all, you have to find the enemy, or I suppose technically you need to find all the enemy. Now, luckily the um, game gives you a clue, you know, you're heading towards the enemy. If you put up some search planes, those search planes will be fanned towards the enemy. So you kind of know where it's coming. It's a bit of a clue, um, but it can be difficult to know when you know all of them are there. And so you have to plan, first of all, to meet the first enemy force that you see, and then bear in mind that other forces may appear, and decide which way you're going to go, how are you going to exploit um, the coastline, for example, to limit their tactical options, or indeed the wind, to limit their flying off options for their carriers, and so on. And expect this to need replanning, which I think you see me do quite a few times once sort of things develop into a bit of a mess as they often do it's like oh let's just pause for a moment and decide what we're going to do or here's a new force i didn't see coming well let's let's see what we can do with that execute the plan and give it some time now inevitably the enemy's going to react uh they're not just going to you know play ball and let you dominate and so you may need to go back and plan again, or you may just need to allow this plan to carry on. It's a bit of a suck it and see uh, thing. And then finally, have a very conscious decision of when to end. When have you won well enough to leave with all your ships intact and your squadrons all pretty fresh and uh, not knocked about? Um, or indeed, when to disengage when you clearly are facing superior force. The whole, the whole effort of this, certainly in the, the style of play that I've evolved, is to evolve, avoid what I used to do, which is kind of the eternal chase, either me chasing them or they chasing me. But it's like, you know, there's some ships. Hooray, go after them. No, we can all be a little bit better than that. Next, I want to consider cruisers, because cruisers are kind of um, in between -y class of vessels. Sometimes they act like mini battleships, and sometimes they act like overlarge destroyers. If they are acting as mini battleships against less powerful ships than themselves, then usually their guns will be their preeminent weapon, and you can treat them effectively um, like battleships in the way that you Try to maximize the hit probability of your gunfire by not rushing around all over the place and spoiling your gun aim. However, 
if you're up against more powerful ships, then you're kind of now operating as if you were a oversized destroyer and torpedoes are your, far, um, are your friend. So agility and maneuver and trying to weave yourself into a fire solution for your torpedoes is definitely the way to go. So two very different styles of play with uh, cruisers to just bear in mind. Convoys next. Uh, I do love a convoy battle. Um, they're often critical to successive invasions um, to either defeat an enemy one or continue to prosecute your own one. They are a bit bonkers. The AI does a terrible job of controlling how the convoy sails. In particular, you know, they just randomly have courses with no mindfulness as to where on earth the enemy is. That's great if you're attacking because they can just as equally fall under your guns as anything else. Um, and of course, it's deeply annoying if you're defending because they're off sacrificing yourself and you'd really rather not. Um, I treat convoys like a, a fixed point in the battle. Um, so I try to sidestep the escort and get around to the convoy if I'm attacking rather than just barreling, barreling in. I've done a bit of barreling in my time and you know, often it doesn't work well, especially when the enemy defenders are intermixed amongst the merchant ships and it's quite hard to spot them. And then suddenly a whole pile of torpedoes are uh, blowing up against your hull. And obviously if you're defending, you do the opposite and you try and get in between your enemy and the convoy and kind of distract them. Hello, look over here, come and chase me. Ignore, ignore the convoy over there. So very much uh, an interesting tactical exercise. Detached forces. So I, I used to have a little bit of a dismissive attitude to uh, forces that were detached. Um, in this 1922 battle uh, it, south of Malta, I kind of got into trouble with that because if they're under your, not under your control, I should say, then you know, you can kind of cozy up to them a bit and try and get them to support you, but often they just go and do their own thing. And that's frustrating and annoying. And so the tendency is to flounce off and go, well, they can. I can't control them, so they can just go and do what they like, which unfortunately isn't very helpful because if they get sunk, there's no, you know, let off saying, well, it's not my fault. You still get the victory point penalty against you. So you really need to stay close to and support slash be supported by your detached AI controlled support force. Heavy weather. Um, I think heavy weather for me is, and, and this early battle against Italy um, really made this uh, come to the fore. It's a bit like terrain in land battles in that it changes all the normal relative uh, balance between units. So battle cruisers become like battleships because they can't go at their normal 28 knots. They're limited in this case to 22. So they're effectively weak battleships or under armored battleships, I should say. Um, the torpedo threat when uh, speed is limited like this goes down because destroyers and light cruisers really struggle to reach a good firing solution because they're slow. And if they do try and reach one, well, it takes an awful long time and is well telegraphed beforehand that this is what's going to happen. Um, so they can't get into a good long uh, launch position. Um, they take more damage because of that slowness. Um, so oddly enough, you can be bolder with your battleships because they are free from being outflanked by battle cruisers or um, being sandwiched between the battle fleet and the battle cruisers and that kind of thing. And they are freer from being torpedoed, as long as they keep a respectful distance, of course. So think of the heavy weather as um, something that completely changes some of the advantages of some of the naval vessels have. Carrier strike force tactics. Now, I do cover a bit of this, a significant bit of it, in um, in my earlier videos on tactics. 
but I didn't have then as much carrier battle practice as I do now. So my top tips here are, number one, prep your strike force before dawn. I mean, I know the number of times I've forgotten to do this, particularly if the battle starts at or near dawn and I'm rushed off to do the whole find the enemy plan and all of that kind of stuff. And no, prep your strike force. And also, uh, its close friend, launch your scouts. Number two, launch strike on the first or certainly the second CV rep scout report that you get. Although the scout reports can be a bit creative when it's deciding whether something is a heavy cruiser or a battleship, it gets flat tops wrong very rarely. So if there's a carrier reported, then there's certainly a carrier there or reasonably certainly a carrier there. Keep your cap strong. Now, sometimes I'm over guilty of keeping my cap strong. So certainly at the start, keep your cap uh, at heavy or if you've been positioned very close to enemy air bases, possibly even at maximum, yes, this will expose your strike forces to greater losses because they'll be much more vulnerable to the enemy's cap. And then maybe as you start to do some hits on their carriers, if you're aware of that, then you can loosen uh, or weaken your cap and increase the escort to your strike force later on. But initially, yeah, keep your, your cap strong because yes, your strike forces may take a lot of hits, but that's a lot better than losing one of your carriers. Keep a second strike force available for evolving opportunity to targets. Yes, I know this does make the carriers quite vulnerable if they then are attacked and take a hit, can't be helped, um, but it does make you much more responsive. And particularly if you have launched on your first reports of CV and then another report pops up, say a battleship, battle cruiser striking force um, nearish by, then you've got this second strike force prepared to go after it um, and really give them a hard time. And then finally, watch where the wind takes you. So you have to do flying operations into the wind. Is that going to take you away from your fleet? So are you going to have to launch your air units with the gap between your fleet and your battleships getting wider and wider and then turn your carriers back towards the fleet once those launch operations are finished and then go back and then turn? Or are you being constantly driven to get closer to closer to the enemy because in order to launch your uh, air wings you need to get closer and closer to the enemy in which case you need to you know take a step back once uh, the launch is gone so just just be aware of that and also probably be aware of the coastline as well because that can severely limit um, particularly if the wind is effectively driving you towards the coast uh, and time to stop. Um, as with all of the battles, you know, it can be very tempting and seductive, you know, just one more uh, strike and they'll be finished kind of thing. For me, you know, when you've used your torpedoes, that's probably the hints that, you know, you, you haven't got much more um, significant strike capability left and it's probably a good time to stop. Okay, over to you guys. I could make some reference to you being my crew and all that kind of stuff. Let's not do that. But what you have been is incredibly incisive and delightfully sharing of your thoughts and ideas and experiences. You know, I, I was reflecting, I wouldn't have completed this game if you hadn't been watching and commenting and helping and interested. And so thank you for that. They're in no particular order, although I've tried to divide it up into a few sorts of things. So first of all, um, I've called it fleet design because that's you know where a lot of your energy and uh, mental power has been. First of all, some ideas. So um, I think this is genius. I mean, it's it's a bit spawny, uh, you know. Um, building an AMC carrier. So you build an AMC uh, as large and fast as you can and then convert it to a CV 
and you get a much quicker, cheaper CV. And, and this is, uh, so thank you Total War for that. This is completely, you know, in line, all nations thought about and did convert merchant ships into uh, carriers as part of a wartime emergency. So, I mean, that has a great history and it's the sort of thing I would never have thought of. So thank you very much for that. Coastal batteries don't just help prevent invasions, but also help in suppressing rebellions. Um, Paul Mallon, thank you for that. I, again, I, I wouldn't have thought of that at all. And it makes me think that, you know, you get a few coastal batteries in your home territories. Well, they never rebel and they never get invaded. So why don't you just scrap them and put your coastal battery money into those imperial provinces that actually you're keen to protect and keen not to rebel. Um, Timothy pointed out that dive bombers become the preferred method of strike in the 50s. I, I completely missed this. I was a bit torpedo-centric. You know, torpedoes in the 20s, 30s and 40s are the primary method of attack. Um, but as the bombs get bigger from dive bombers, and also medium bombers as well, the ability to protect against armor-piercing bombs really goes down. And um, yeah, everything becomes very vulnerable to them. Some recommendations from you guys. So Pat suggested this kind of ratio. So per battleship slash battle cruiser, um, having four destroyers, three quarters of a heavy cruiser, three quarters of a carrier, and fit in the CLs as possible until the SAMs. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. That feels like perfectly nice ratio and of course the SAMs bit is very wise because when SAMs become available then actually light like cruisers really step up in terms of the air defense for the fleet that they can do. Later destroyers are very powerful now I'm you know aware of this but I actually have it spelt out you know day and night their air defense their ability to sink big ships their ability to drive away small ships, and of course their ASW, they're just useful for everything. Um, Box of Nord picked me up for not using the incremental design improvement. So you have an existing ship, you open it up, and you improve it by 10 to 20%. He pointed out that this is a lot more efficient. It costs a lot less to design in this way than it is to start with a completely fresh piece of paper and do something new. And he says, you know, you could easily buy a, uh, a light cruiser for the kinds of savings that you make uh, if you follow this. And you're also more likely to be offered the additional one ship at 10% discount as well. Yes, I, I, I hadn't taken that on board at all. And I am very prone to um, designing with a blank piece of paper. So thanks for that one. Interesting. More observations. Um, the blockade strength you need tends to make you build more battlecruisers and battleships than you would otherwise. Uh, I think that's just something to be aware of. Uh, and possibly also keep battleships in service that otherwise you would scrap. The attrition between battleships and aircraft uh, favours the aircraft by the 40s because they're just so much quicker and cheaper to replace. So be aware that your battleships in the 40s and again the 50s are going to be a wasting effort and you use them as a protection for your carriers but also you know they may well be vulnerable to very expensive uh, losses. Romalan also pointed out that wartime emergency vessels are badly shown in the game. I absolutely agree. I wish it wasn't, you know, escort carriers. Our merchant cruisers, I believe, are nearly useless because they take like eight months to both build and then work up. Um, and, you know, a lot of wars are obviously over by eight months or a year or just over a year. Uh, ditto the converted trawlers. You know, these should be really easy to... These, these are pre-planned and should be very easy to set up. And of course, the whole destroyer escort uh, missing. And uh, yeah, the question mark over MTBs. 
I would love motor torpedo boats to work. I think I've seen them pop up in one battle. Um, not in this series, but um, off video. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, they're not super expensive, but they're also not as helpful as you'd hope. And uh, the seaplane tenders should be set up to patrol, set up uh, bases in areas out of uh, range of your land-based air, uh, which is, of course, historically true and would be very useful in the Pacific and, and the Indian Oceans. More observations. Um, scouting groups and that kind of mission should probably end sooner. And missions like coastal raids, yeah. Um, I mean, yes, in the early 40s, they did do some coastal raids. You know, Force H went sailing up into the north of Italy to bombard the ports there. Very risky. Um, I don't think they particularly enjoyed it and they, they weren't particularly keen to repeat it. Obviously, there are some missing aircraft types that would be lovely if Ruler Wave 3 uh, introduced these kinds of things. Um, I got picked up by Fox of the Nord for my use of the limited dock size. Um, it says interesting, um, but wouldn't necessarily save you money because inefficiency in rebuilds if you needed to refit more than once for the desired feature. And inefficiency if you have the technology, but others with the dock sides you don't need. Um, for me, I thought it worked pretty well. What you can do is, obviously for the battleships, you have to build them overseas. Um, for everything else, you could build it at home. So it was really only the battleships and battle cruisers that it mattered. I could... Keep one consistent ally, and I managed to keep Britain as a long-term ally in this game, so that worked really well. Had I used the incremental design improvement, making a battleship 10 or 20% better, I would have had a more economic time. Um, for the ships in France, for example, you know, the famous five-inch dual-purpose guns never came my way until very, very, very late. But what you can do is you can go to another country and fit it in the other country and then bring it back. It's effectively like purchasing those guns from another country and then fitting them locally. So for me, it uh, it was quite a useful tactic. Obviously, if you're Britain and America, you wouldn't do this, you know, you're stuffed with money. But if you are tight for money, if you're a France or an Italy or a Russia, um, then I think it's a, a very legitimate tactic to do. Alone, God forbid, to Spain. China. More observations. Um, around the fleet protection from Timothy, he says that actually the minesweeping and ASW ratings matter less than the number of hulls. Now, I have no, um, no way of testing this particularly, but I have seen others. I was co-commentating a game with No Name Spore, and you know he had like 200 escort vessels, 250 even, massive amounts of them. Um, so it, it's it's certainly a thought. I di I didn't really find that my ASW and my mine sweeping were particularly bad. Yes, I did lose an important carrier. I think it was to mines, kind of at random. But you know that's sort of what happens sometimes. I'm not sure if having a massive mine sweeping force would reduce that. And it's very hard to know because, because the maths underneath the model of this is opaque and you don't see what it does. It's very hard to uh, model accurately. Um, Timothy says the AI likes to spawn submarines when losing a war. I didn't get that as a particular problem. Um, possibly because I, I like to try and keep my wars short because in Rule of Waves 2, if you keep your wars long, it just massively stuffs money into all the other navies that aren't fighting. That's been corrected in Rule of Waves 3. Through, <laughs> Rule of Waves 3. So, uh, yeah, that will be interesting to see how Rule of Waves 3 starts to, uh, to change that. And some questions that you raised. So, first of all, several of you pointed out the evergreen quality versus quantity in particularly battleship design dependent on fleet size. So if you've got a big fleet, 
having quantity is absolutely fine and you don't necessarily need to gold plate every single battleship because you've got money for tons of them. However, if you don't and you've got a small fleet, then you need to make every single battleship as effective as you possibly can. Um, late 40s, 50s airs not really accounted for very well either. So, yeah. The use of jets isn't really in there, and things like proximity fuses making torpedo boat uh, torpedo bomber attacks hard slash suicidal isn't really there either. So thank you so much for those comments. I really enjoyed reading them and thinking about them. There are certainly some things that were different and new for me. Um, I hope it was interesting for you too. I probably have one final video to make to kind of wrap up this series. If there's any particular content you'd like to see in that, then please chip in in the comments below. And otherwise, stay well. And thanks for watching.